Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Monday, September 20th, 2021, and today we're going to be talking about the 2022 United States Senate elections according to the political prediction betting markets. As you may know, my recent projection for the Senate race puts the Republican Party in the advantage to reclaim the Senate majority with a majority of 52 seats to 48. Now, the reason why we're looking at the political betting markets is because in a very similar fashion to my channel, these people try to take an analytical and in a sense unbiased point of view as to how each individual race will go. And the reason why the stakes are so much higher is because while publishing a YouTube video, of course, is very important, putting your actual money into the races is also very important. On predicted.org, people are allowed to put in their own money into how they think elections will go, essentially betting on political elections, United States ones, and across the world. But specifically, I'm focused on the Senate elections. I think that, historically speaking, looking at my 2018 and 2020 analysis of where the political prediction betting markets and what they were saying on the maps themselves then, they were very good indicators as to how well many of these races went for incumbents and for opposition candidates. And I think that it is just very important to take a look at them because they do offer new forms of insight. Because these people are putting their hard-earned money into this race, into many races across the nation, they will put aside personal preferences, personal biases. Nobody benefits by lying to themselves by funneling money into an individual market. So we are going to take a look at every single state here that is on the market. I believe we have, let me count here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 total races that will be discussed here. The rest will be considered to be safe because if they aren't on the political uh, political betting market, they probably aren't going to be competitive in 2022. We've seen last minute changes to competitive states. Recently speaking in 2020, maybe the state of Alabama or South Carolina or Kansas, states that otherwise would be completely ignored and will be completely ignored for the sake of this election prediction, uh, prediction analysis for uh, the political betting markets. But ended up being competitive, surprisingly, and ended up forming uh, this. They started to form new political production betting markets for these individual states. But you already know which states will be competitive and which won't be. You've been watching my channel for quite some time, or if you haven't, welcome to a first video or one of your first few videos. But point is that many of these states will not be competitive. Straight off the bat, the Democratic Party has 45 Senate seats that they can say without a doubt they will either not have up for re-election, which is the majority in this case, and then they will also have an additional few seats that will not be competitive at all. I believe this is a total of eight seats, three on the West Coast, four in the Northeast, and one in the state of Illinois and Hawaii. So, uh, more than that. But overall, you will see here that the Democratic Party has 10, I believe, 10, uh, sorry, nine races that are deemed to be safe, meaning that they won't be competitive. The Republican Party also has their fair share of these, ranging from Idaho to Utah to North and South Dakota uh, to the state of Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, Kentucky, Indiana, South Carolina, and Alabama. So all of these bring us to a total with 42 seats for uh, the uh, Republican Party and 46 for the Democratic Party. Now, surprisingly, one race that is not on the political prediction betting market, and maybe we will find it right now, is the state of Colorado. So Sorry about that, but I actually cut over to go ahead and check on the predicted market to see if Colorado would be on the list here. Now, uh, Colorado is not on the list, and that is actually very surprising considering that some Republicans, Rick Scott actually even saying that he believes that Colorado will be competitive in 2022. Only time will tell. I am just personally very surprised that a state such as Missouri is on the list in Alaska, whereas Colorado is not. But for the sake of this video, I'm not going to make exceptions. I'm going to keep it in the safe Democratic column. My most recent projection has it in the likely column. At a point in time, I did also have it in the safe column. So I can partially see where they're coming from. But given the national circumstances with Joe Biden's approval rating and the issues across the world and across the nation, I wouldn't exactly make that characterization now. But I'm not going to argue with them on that point. That's not the purpose of this video. So looking at our 2022 Senate races here, 12 total toss-up races, and I'm sure you can already guess which ones will be deemed the most competitive by this standard and the least competitive. Now, I first want to make a declaration as to how I'm making these characterizations. I wish YPMS had a little notes tab that you could bring up on the side of the screen just for the sake of uh, viewing and understanding the way that the video goes. But I will put this in the description box down below and also in the pinned comment. Essentially, 50 to 60 cents in a certain candidate's favor or a certain political party's favor is considered to be a tilt race. That is denoted by the standard uh, tilt blue 
and tilt red. It's actually pretty dark once you actually get to look at it. 61 to 70 cents in favor of a political party or candidate is a lean. That is the lighter red. That is the lighter blue. Moving on, 60, uh, sorry, 71 cents to 80 cents is likely, which means that you will have a little bit lighter of a red, but still a darker shade, not as much of an uh, opacity difference there, and a darker blue. And then safe will be the ones that we already know. Safe blue is here, and safe red is here. So let's revert everything back to normal. Let's go back to normal Arkansas, normal Louisiana, normal Indiana, normal Illinois. The states of Iowa and Missouri are not characterized that way. I was just using it for the sake of example. So we'll start off with the tilt states. These are states that are deemed to be the most competitive and by my own political standard for uh, what I would characterize as tilt also deemed to be the most competitive. We'll start off with the state of, uh, let's see here actually, let me go ahead and pick one state that is probably not super talked about much. Actually, this one absolutely is. Wisconsin, which is a state in which it is 57 cents for a yes or uh, a share for the Republican Party winning in this state and 44 cents. For the Democrats. Now, this actually pretty much aligns with the way that I view the state of Wisconsin at this point in time. It's a state that the Democratic Party has and continues to have major hopes for, but needs the year environment to be on their side. In the 2020 presidential election, the state of Wisconsin only went to Joe Biden by 0.6%. For reference, Joe Biden won the popular vote by five points and has had a very strong advantage in the Rust Belt, considering that he was from the Rust Belt in the state of Pennsylvania. Wisconsin was a state that Democrats were expected to win by six, seven points, sometimes eight points. Right now, preliminary election data is saying Tom Nelson, the Democrat, will win here by four points. You can't exactly compare, I would say, the polling inaccuracies for President Trump to the other Republicans across the nation. But there still is that underrepresented Republican vote share that at this point in time, considering that the Democrats were only ahead by four points when Biden was up 10 points, and nationally speaking, now that Biden is in the negative, you can certainly expect the rest of these people to fall into the negative, including the Democrats in the state of Wisconsin. So I think this is correct. The next state that is characterized as tilt is the state of Georgia. This is not a flip either. The state of Georgia goes to the Democrats by a tilt margin. I'm sure they are very happy about that, but it's very close. 54 cents for the Democrats, 49 cents for the Republicans. Moving over to the next tilt state. This is actually a flip. This is the state of Pennsylvania. This is a state where you are looking at it go from uh, the state itself being a Republican state with Pat Toomey now being a Democratic state. We don't know which political betting market shows the uh, Democratic primary. I believe Fetterman is in the advantage, but Connor Lamb and Fetterman are in a very close and hotly contested primary here. Should be very interesting. Pennsylvania, a tilt margin for the Democrats, 58 cents for Democrats, 44 cents for Republicans. And the final state that is in the tilt margin is actually the closest Senate election according to predicted. And I also stand by that characterization that this is the closest Senate election, or at least one of the closest was, was the closest one in 2016. The state of New Hampshire, in which the Republicans are expected to get a victory here, by the narrowest and slimmest of margins, 52 cents for a GOP share, 51 cents for a Democratic share. Extremely close, absolutely uh, safe to be in the tilt column there. Uh, so overall, what do we have so far? Counteracted flips. I'm going to tell you right now, there are no more flips. There are no more flips on this map. If that saves you any time, um, I do apologize, but I don't control the betting markets. But it's still worth staying on this video to continue going down because some of these states end up being characterized in different ways than you might expect. But New Hampshire and Pennsylvania are two states that have uh, the opposing parties uh, currently in office. For Pennsylvania, the Republicans are in office, and in New Hampshire, the Democrats are in office. Well, these races are expected to be amongst the competitive ones and the flip ones. So now that there's a GOP gain and a Democratic gain, the overall numbers average out, and we're back to ground zero. Let's continue on. So for the lean margin, what does this mean? This is anywhere between 1% and 5% in the margin of victory. But again, predict it doesn't go by that. I'm just using their own uh, individual costs for a certain political party to win. This is anywhere from $0.61 cents to $0.70. Cents. We'll start off with the $0.61 cents for a Democratic share in the state of Arizona. I think this is because Mark Kelly is widely viewed as a strong candidate and someone who has a very strong political future. I think personally that he will win re-election as well. The state of Nevada, $0.60 cents for a Democratic share, $0.38 cents for a Republican share. This is a state that also people widely expect the Democrats to win based off history, based off the 2020 results, based off the 2016 Senate results, and based off the incumbency factor. Even if the year isn't too beneficial for the Democrats, Nevada actually has been surprisingly strong enough to hold out for many Democrats across the state, even when years aren't exactly in their favor. So you know based off now, based off of our lean characterization, that Democrats will be retaining the majority according to the predicted market. 
but we can continue down and keep working our way up because it gets less interesting as you move on, but it will also get much faster and we will reach the end of this video much quicker now that we're moving on beyond this point. The majority point is the majority is according to predicted going to stay with the Democratic Party. Now for the Republicans, where are their lean races? Well, they have North Carolina, which is 65 cents for a share for the Republican Party uh, and only 35 cents for a Democratic Party. Now, this is also quite surprising. It is probably one of the more lopsided, very competitive races in North Carolina. I would rank up there with the competitiveness, not necessarily of Pennsylvania or New Hampshire, but certainly could be one of the more competitive races in 2022. Right now, I expect it to be a likely margin, so I sort of stand by this characterization, but I also do want to say that I am quite surprised just because North Carolina, regardless of how I personally characterize it, is typically regarded as a very competitive state. But I also think that people are very smart when it comes down to money, and they recognize that North Carolina is probably not going to go to the Democrats in 2022, especially as it stands today. Moving over into the next characterization, we have likely states. These are states that should be characterized uh, and meaning that they will be won by respective candidates between 5 and 15 percent. But Thing is, we only have one likely state. Can you guess what it is? Out of Alaska, where Lisa Murkowski has not announced her re-election bid. Out of Ohio and Iowa, states that are typically very competitive. Out of Missouri, which was decided by three points in the 2016 Senate election. Florida, a state that has always come down to the wire and is amongst the narrowest of political swing states in recent electoral history. Well, it's not Florida. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's not Alaska. I'm also going to tell you that. It's not Missouri which leaves Ohio and Iowa. <clears throat> and the thing is, the state of Ohio is the state that's characterized as likely. This is a state in which it is a 79 cent share purchase for the Republican Party and 21 cents for the Democratic Party. That's good for the GOP. That is a good sign that they are on track to win this Senate race. But it also does say that Ohio will likely be the most competitive out of the five I just mentioned. Surprising ones, Florida maybe, Iowa, maybe. Alaska, maybe. Even Missouri, for those who know election history in the state. Missouri nearly had two Democratic senators following the 2016 presidential election. The only reason why Roy Blunt won that race was because Donald Trump was on the ballot. No more, no less. But for 2022, we will not be in a similar circumstance. Jason Kander will not be running, and Democrats can't really find the best candidate to run in this Senate race. Overall, though, that means the remaining states are all going to be characterized as safe. That's right. Missouri sort of makes sense. Alaska, eh, makes sense, but not so much. Iowa, that's a shocker. Florida, another shocker. I do personally think that you can characterize safely Missouri and Alaska as safe. But Alaska, surprisingly enough, has actually had some pretty competitive history. The only reason why I characterize it as safe is not because there isn't Democratic opposition to Lisa Murkowski, but because there is Republican opposition. And the top two contenders... The top two contenders here when it comes down to these race, this individual race, are Republicans, which means if ranked choice voting goes through the way that it normally does, two Republicans will end up on that finalized ballot and people will decide between GOP and GOP. It's just a question of what type of Republican Party member. But for Florida to be characterized as safe is also a major thing. Florida is never a safe state. Take a look at the state's electoral history since the beginning of the 21st century. This is the Senate. Let's head over to the presidential race. You can see here that in 2000, it was decided by a margin of 0 0.009%. 2004, it was 5 points. In 2008, it was 3 points. 2012, it was less than a point. 2016, it was a point. In 2020, it was 3 points. Florida is almost always competitive. But the one person who was able to defy that expectation in 2010 when he was elected won by 20 points because there was a split between Democratic support, Marco Rubio. 2016, won by eight points on the same ballot. Donald Trump won by one point. Now in 2022, it is fair to estimate that he will win by a pretty considerable margin. Do I personally think safe? No, I do not. But do I think that this characterization in terms of the way that people expect the race to go, in terms of the political betting market, it absolutely makes sense. People don't want to be wrong about Florida more than once in their lifetimes. Florida is that state that does throw people for loops. Sometimes it votes for Democrats. Mostly votes for Republicans, but there are a few exceptions. And I do think that it is a state that is just very interesting considering how close it almost always is and how Republican it also always is. Overall, though, the final map here stands 50 Republicans, 50 Democrats. What does this mean? Pennsylvania was a flip. New Hampshire was a flip. But they averaged out because they flipped in opposite directions. 
Pennsylvania goes to the Democratic Party, a state that voted for Joe Biden by just a point ends up going to the Democrats. Maybe that makes sense. But in New Hampshire, a state that Biden won by eight points, now people are expecting the Republicans to pick up a victory there. I'm not questioning that, though. We know that the GOP has a much stronger field of contenders in New Hampshire than they do in Pennsylvania. But the point is that they defy our traditional expectations of these states, and a lot of these characterizations are quite surprising to me. The fact Colorado doesn't even have a market, the fact that Florida is considered to be safe, the fact there are no other likely states besides Ohio and no other lean GOP states besides North Carolina, quite fascinating, if you ask me. Overall, though, no real change at all. We're back to where we started, 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans, and we're right exactly where we stand today. It will be a continuation for four years at least of a 50-50 Senate where the vice president will break the tie, which means Democrats retain the majority in this scenario. But it's just very interesting to see how we go practically full circle back to where we began at the beginning of this election prediction prediction and or this election analysis and actually where we are in today's political climate. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, this video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 Senate election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.